us pray. Dear gracious and loving Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for all you've done and all you're going to do. I ask you, Lord, to reach down and touch your word. Help us to receive from your word what you'd have us to receive. Lead, guide, and direct. Show us your will and your way in all things. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. Let us turn to 1 Kings chapter 6, starting with the first verse. That's 1 Kings chapter 6, starting with the first verse. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of, Solomon, of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziph, of which it is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. And the, and the house which King Solomon built for the Lord the length thereof was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof was twenty cubits, and the height thereof was thirty cubits. The porch bef uh, before the temple of the house, twenty cubits, was the length thereof, according to the breadth of the house, and ten, uh, and ten cubits was the breadth thereof before the house. And for the house... He made windows of narrow glass, of narrow lights. And against the wall of the house, he built cha chambers around, and, and against the, uh, the walls of the house, around about uh, both the temple and of the oracle. And he made chambers around about. And the nethermost chamber w was five cubits broad, and the middle was six cubits broad, and the third was seven cubits broad. For without, uh, for for without in the wall of the house, he was he made narrow rests round about, that the beams should not be uh, be fastened in the walls of the house. And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready for, uh, before it was brought thither, so that th there is neither hammer nor axe nor, t uh, nor any tool of iron head heard in the house while it was, being build while it was building. <clears throat> now there was a lot of detail that went into the building of the temple. And the reason, and all the minute details had to be accomplished because it was, besides being the house of God at the time, it represented what the house of God would be in the future. We, as the people of God, according to the New Testament, are the temple of God. Therefore, all the minute details matter. God cares about the minute details. He cares about the minute details in, in something as trivial as a building. You know he's going to care about the minute details in your life. He cares about where you are with him. He cares about what you're going through. He cares about the, the trials and tribulations you face. He cares about all his people. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. That's Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. In glory by Christ Jesus. <clears throat> now, that is a promise distinctly offered to God to his people. Those that are following him, those who are part of his church, those that are the temple of God. 
too many are taking and going through and confusing and thinking that God has made promises to everyone. And he has made some promises to everyone. He promises that if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, he will save your soul. He will forgive your sins. He will cleanse you from your sin. And he'll place you on the road to eternity in heaven. That's one of his promises to everyone. All you have to do is accept the gift. Now, once you've accepted the gift, at that point in time, he makes you part of his church. You can't become part of God's church by being voted in. You can't become part of God's church by taking and going through and shaking the preacher's hand. No amount of baptism will make you part of the church. You have to come through the blood of Christ. The Lord adds to the church. And only the Lord can add to the church. I can't put you in the church and I can't take you out. Only God can put you into his church. So that is when we become the temple of God. That's when he says that he, he enables us to, for him to dwell in us. We become his temple. So, as his temple, as his people, we then get more promises. He promises to supply all our need. Now, our greatest need is salvation. But he supplies food, clothing, shelter, He's already said that, that, he, that if we seek first the kingdom of God, he'll add all those things to us. God cares about the little things. I've heard people take and go, oh, well, that's just too small for me to ask God about that. Why? God cares about the little things. There's nothing you're going through that he doesn't care about. There is nothing that you will ever face that he doesn't care about. There's no need that you've got that is too great for God or too little for God. He will provide for his people. All we have to do is be uh, to accept him and serve him. That's all. The promise is made. Will we carry forth and accept it? Matthew chapter 7, starting with the 7th verse. That's Matthew chapter 7, starting with the 7th verse. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. What man is there of you, whom, if his son ask bread, will give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly fa shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things uh, to them that ask him? I have to watch it because there's another verse that's worded almost identical to it, but it says heavenly Father instead of Father in heaven. <clears throat> so, God only promises to give us good gifts. He never promises that he's going to give us everything we want. There is a common doctrine that's floating around in our modern age that if you ask it, he's got to give it to you no matter what it is. That's not true. God gives good gifts 
He doesn't just give anything. There are some things that we may want that are actually destructive to us. And you know, God doesn't promise those. God only promises to give us good gifts. Just like if you're asking bread, he'll, he'll give you bread rather than a stone. If you're asking for a fish, he'll give you a fish rather than a serpent. You know, he gives us good things, things that are good for us. Not something that's going to harm us, not something that's going to do damage to us. Because he wants us to have a good life. Now, that doesn't mean he wants us to take and, ha and be spoiled rotten. And if we got everything we asked for, no matter what it was, we would be spoiled rotten. He knows what is best for us. He knows what isn't good for us. And he will give us what's best for us. His will always moves to what is best for people. That's why sometimes he allows us to go through some bad times. You know, there's a, there are people out there that think, oh, well, if you're going through a hardship, then you've walked away from God, and therefore God is punishing you. Well, that may be true, but it's not necessarily true. Sometimes God lets us go through trials and tribulations. Why? To make us stronger. To teach us something. So that we learn to trust and rely on him more. You know, you always rely on God the most when you're going through the hard times. You tend not to rely on God a lot when you're going through easy times. That's true with all of us. I've often said that people's faith tends to be like a sine wave. High, low, high, low, high, low. Well, when we're, our faith is strong, we need to be taking and supporting others. When our faith is low, we need to accept the support from others so that, so that others' faith will help lift us up. Because God knows what we're going through. And he wants us as a community to take and support each other. It says where two or more are gathered together in, in my name, I am in the midst. It also says where two or more pray on anything touching, it will be done. That's communal uh, prayer. That's a supporting each other. Where one may have a low faith, the other one has a strong faith. And when the, t uh, when the, f the sine wave flips, we, uh, the, the positions change. Where one, uh, the other one becomes the supporter and the other one needing support. We take and hear people a lot of times just taking and say, well, that person just didn't get healed because he didn't have enough faith. What about the people praying for him? I don't expect a sick person or a person in a lot of pain to have a lot of faith. What about the people praying for them? When you're going through your darkest times, you get desperate and you'll rely on God. But what about those who are around you? Do they rely on God? Are the others praying, relying on God? Too many times, people are not getting healed or not getting their needs taken care of because people don't expect it. They're not trusting God for it. It's kind of like the story about the person who uh, was looking out over a mountain and prayed and asked God to remove the mountain. Then looked out there and said, I knew it wouldn't go anywhere. Well, maybe that's the problem. They didn't believe it would go anywhere. 
I've had people take and ask me, well, have you ever seen anybody walk on water? No, but I believe it can be done. Just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean I don't believe it. And technically speaking, there's only been two people that I know of that have ever walked on water. Jesus and Peter. Now Jesus, being God in the flesh, that's not such a big, uh, big thing. Peter was totally human. And when he, said, uh, when he took and said, well, if that's you, bid me to come to you. And Jesus said, come, and he got out of the boat. That takes faith. Now, Peter was not an ignorant individual. He was a fisherman. And as a fisherman, he knew what water was. And he knew what it could do. He got out of the boat. He got out of the boat, and he wasn't till he took his eyes off Christ that he began to sink. So we need to keep our eyes on Christ so we don't sink. We need to keep our eyes on Christ so that our faith is strong enough to carry us forward into whatever we, we face, whatever it is. Whether it be tribulations, whether it be persecutions, whether it be hardships, whether it be illness, whether it be financial problems. Whatever the problem is, we need to keep our eyes on Christ and walk forward. And we need to trust God. Now here it's strictly said that there was some actions involved. And I don't know how many times I've heard preachers stand up and say, Oh, well, yeah, you're serving God. You never have to do anything. That isn't what it says. It says they had the person had to seek, they had to knock, and they had to ask. Three different actions. Asking is the simplest. We any of us can ask. In fact, a lot of people I, I treat God like he's a vending machine. Just drop your prayer in and push the button you want. So any of us know how to ask. But sometimes we have to do a little more than ask. Sometimes we have to seek the answer. We have to search for it. But it says if we seek, we'll find. And then we have, sometimes we have to go a step farther and we have to beat on the door. We got to knock. Because there's an opposition in the way. There's something standing between us and the answer. Now it doesn't say we have to kick the door down. It says we have to knock. We have to recognize the problem, recognize what's in the way, and ask God to take care of it. We have to knock. Had a person at the campgrounds just this week ask me what to do about an individual, another camper that they had that was coming into their trailer, just walking in. And I told them, they're not knocking. I said, no, they're not knocking. Call the cops. That happens to be criminal trespass. But if they knock, that's a different story. God's asking us to, to come and knock. In fact, it says he knocks. He knocks at our door. 
get us get our attention. So so, uh, so there are times that we have to take action. If we're praying and not putting legs on our prayers, then do we really have faith that God's going to answer? The Bible says that faith without works is dead. So our actions, how we live our lives, what we do, should show what we believe God is going to do. What kind of actions we're expecting from God. If we are praying that God heal somebody, we should take and be expecting to see that person healed. We should be living like we're expecting God to, be, to do the healing. If we're praying for somebody financially, we should expect there to be a new job or some, something happening to take in and help them financially. Even if it's somebody just walking up and handing them money. And I've, see, I've had that happen to me. When it comes down to it, God can work in lots of different ways. We need to let him work in his way. But we need to be living, expecting to see God answering our prayers. If we are praying that God will take and save someone, we should be expecting to see openings to present the gospel to them. Or that God will send somebody to them to present the gospel to them, that they'll listen to. Because they won't always listen to us. But God knows exactly who they will listen to. Now, it doesn't mean that they'll always accept. But, the, uh, but if we're truly believing in God, we should be looking for the opening. Because God's giving them an opportunity. He's opening the door so they can be saved. Let's go to James chapter 4, starting with the third verse. It's James chapter 4, starting with the third verse. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So, we can ask wrongly and then not get it. Here it says they ask amiss because they want to consume it upon their own lust. It's, it's something that is going to spiritually destroy them. Because the Bible is very clear that lust leads to sin. So, we're, uh, so if they're praying for something to consume it upon their own lust, it's something that's going to lead them to sin. Then it warns us that friendship with the world is to be an enemy with God. So we should not be pursuing the things of the world. We need to be pursuing the things of God. What the world considers important is not something we should consider important. What the world is chasing after is not where our goals should be. It should, our goals should be where God's goals are. See, God wants to see all of us in heaven. Is that our goal? Should be. God wants to take and get, uh, reach people so that they can improve, uh, their lives are improved so that they are no longer bound by sin and the devil. But they're free. This is all done through the power of God and through his will. So if we're praying that God do that, 
we can expect to see results. But too many people are praying for brand new cars or, or big bank accounts. You know, the Bible says he'll provide our needs. He never says he'll provide our wants. Does he provide some of our wants? Yes, he does. But not any of our wants that will de destroy us. Only wants that aid us. Now, I don't know if you ever took and looked at the cost of repairs of a luxury automobile. But the repairs for a normal car are a lot less than the repairs on a luxury automobile. So in many cases, some of these people who are praying for these luxury automobiles are praying for themselves trouble. When I was working for AutoZone, they told me about a guy who came in and his entire Lincoln was setting on its tires. The, sh uh, the, air, uh, the air struts had gone out in it. And they looked up the price of what the parts would be to fix it. Thousands. And while they were er, talking, the guy says, I know you've got, you've got a Lincoln, but you do realize that the struts on a Mercury or a Ford will fit that car. Yeah, the ride won't be quite as nice, but we're talking hundreds now, not thousands. <laughs> It's like, what was the need, and what was the best way to solve it? Now, this guy already had the luxury automobile. But to get it back on the road, he had to make a choice. Did God, had God provided him enough that he could go the expensive route? In this particular case, no, he hadn't. But he could afford the, the less expensive route. Sometimes when God answers our prayers, he's not going to take us to what they used to refer to as the top shelf. I'll admit that's a little before my time, so I can only go by hearsay. But they say that they used to put the most expensive and best brands of all, everything up on the top shelf and you had to ask for them to get them and they always cost more than everything else that's not the case anymore nowadays the most expensive stuff are going to be at eye level high <laughs> right where everybody can see them if it's, if it's above that height or below that height, it'll probably be cheaper. Because they want people to buy the expensive stuff. Well, sometimes God hasn't provided for that. Now, if he has, good for you. But he doesn't always. Sometimes he only provides our needs, not our wants. When Shelley decided that the uplander had to go to the du uh, junkyard, it was still running. <laughs> I just got it back on the road. But um, got in there, and the junkyard took a look at that, and it's like, 
280,000 miles. We don't want this thing. <laughs> There's no way we want anything with this kind of mileage. Well, granted, it didn't actually have 280,000 miles on it because I had changed the instrument panel out in it. It was a little less, just not a lot less. <laughs> but we didn't uh, we didn't need it anymore and there's no way we're going to be able to sell it. So we took what we could get. God knew what uh, uh, exactly our situation and he provided for that situation it's the way he always works there aren't too many uh, Chevy Uplanders that are still on the road at 280,000 miles <laughs> but God supplies needs he supplies spiritual needs he supplies mental needs he supplies financial needs he supplies physical needs hmm and he does a wonderful job with lost items I don't know if, D if Danielle remembers this, but her dad c uh, called me up and asked me to pray because he'd lost the keys to his truck. And so I prayed. And after a bit later, he called me up. He says, I found them. You'll never believe where, but I found them. I said, well, praise God. Where'd you find him? He said, well, I, uh, I took and searched all over the place for him. Couldn't find him in the truck. Couldn't find him in the house. Couldn't find him on the ground. Couldn't find him anywhere. So I decided, well, you know, it's been months since I changed the air filter on this truck. So he, w uh, so he opened up the, the hood of the car pulled the top off the air filter to take out the filter, and there were his keys. <laughs> Setting right inside the, uh, an air filter that hadn't been opened in months. But that isn't a miracle. I don't know what it is. Because he'd been driving it just the day before. Just, just a day. So it had to be God put them in there. God cares about little things. Apparently God cared about that air filter not having been changed. <laughs> God looks after us. If we'll trust him, and walk with him, and ask him. Let's turn and trust in God. Oh.